Hi, I'm Jo Tindall. I'm New Zealand's High Commissioner to Singapore. And prior to taking up that role, I was New Zealand's climate change ambassador uh, for a number of years. It's a, a, a great uh, pleasure to be speaking at the FinTech Festival this year. Um, and uh, collectively, we've overcome uh, quite a few uh, technological and other challenges to bring you uh, what I hope will be an illuminating interview uh, with Professor Adrian McDonald, who's the director uh, of Gateway Antarctica um, and is currently uh, conducting some scientific work down uh, in the South Pole uh, at uh, Scott Base. Um, the challenges are that uh, he is there in the, in the deep south of the world. I am sitting in managed isolation uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand, prior to uh, um, taking, uh, um, uh, doing some meetings uh, back at home base in, in Wellington. Um, and of course, the Singapore FinTech Festival is happening in Singapore. Um, we've managed to make the technology work. Uh, climate change is such a huge, huge uh, challenge for the world. Uh, and uh, um, in my view, even though we have been very uh, diverted and uh, understandably so by the COVID-19 pandemic this year, we mustn't take our eyes off the climate change ball uh, and the impact uh, that challenges is having on the world. Uh, even as we're seeking to uh, to work our way through uh, the, the pandemic and to rebuild our economies. In fact, uh, we can take uh, um, climate change very much, and we must take climate change very much into consideration as we do that rebuilding work. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Well, it's um, a real privilege and, and a really exciting thing for me to, to be talking to Professor Adrian McDonald, who's the director of Gateway Antarctica. Um, he's normally based uh, uh, at the University, University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, but he is now speaking to us from Scott Base um, down in uh, the Deep South. And it's a, it's a huge uh, uh, pleasure to be having this. It's called a fireside chat, but uh, um, while I'm in summer, um, he's, uh, he's in the depths of uh, um, the Deep South cold. So um, Adrian, uh, a few years ago when I was uh, climate change ambassador, I had the uh, um, unique privilege uh, um, and adventure of traveling to, uh, and I hope uh, Norwegian speakers will uh, forgive my pronunciation, in um, uh, Spitsbergen uh, in the Arctic Circle. Um, which was truly extraordinary and a really uh, um, fascinating place to see climate change impacts uh, in reality. And we've heard lots about the, um, the loss of ice and indeed even about uh, the existence of fires in the Arctic Circle, but quite a lot less about what climate change means for uh, the Antarctic. So I thought we'd begin um, by asking you to explain the difference between the two poles um, and what uh, scientists might be predicting is going to, to happen due to global warming in, in the deep south um, if we don't manage to get climate change under control. Okay, well, first of all, thanks for um, talking to me here. It's, it's a, a unique thing for me as well. I, I've never... Um, expected that Scott Base's internet bandwidth would be good enough that we could have this conversation from Antarctica. Um, so that's great as well. Um, so yes, I, I guess um, I've been studying Antarctica and Antarctic climate change for a, a number of years, and we're all aware that the Arctic sea ice has shown uh, significant decreases in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, the picture's been a little bit more complicated in Antarctica, and that's partly associated with other human-induced factors, though, as well as natural variability around the Antarctic being very large. Um, the Antarctic ozone hole and ozone-depleting substances have an indirect effect on the surface temperatures around Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. So that's had a, a, a mitigating influence on the human-induced change that we're seeing. So we haven't seen much of a change in sea ice um, and in fact we've seen an increase in sea ice around the Antarctic um, up until about 2017 where we saw a record uh, reduction in sea ice and 
uh, a record low Antarctic sea ice extent. So the, the aerial coverage of Antarctic sea ice was a minimum in 2017. And that may be a sign that we are now starting to see greenhouse gases having a, a significant effect on sea ice around Antarctica, which would have very significant climate impacts for the region. Uh, the jury's still out, so over a three-year period, a four-year period in climate change terms is a short period. But um, when I was collecting samples um, of snow only two or three days ago, one of my collection sites that previously I got to last year at this time was in open water, and my second site, the sea ice edge, was much, much closer than it has been before. So there is a significant change, and we are seeing um, changes in Antarctica that are worrying, particularly the Antarctic Peninsula, we're seeing that uh, is warming pretty much faster than anywhere else in the Southern Hemisphere. So that Antarctic Peninsula is definitely seeing significant signs of climate change. And climate model projections are also highlighting significant change in the Antarctic as well as the rest of the world. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's starting to look very, very worrying, as though we didn't have e enough to be concerned about this year with the, the pandemic. Um, I think galloping climate change um, is really starting to, uh, uh, to make its presence felt. Um, uh, I don't know if this is a, the right way to ask this question, but um, what... What in terms of you, you talked about the the uh, starting to see some some worrying uh, um, uh, developments, but what's your worst case scenario um, uh, for the the Antarctic? I I'd understood that um, if we start to lose um, significant ice um, off an ice shelf, for example, uh, that uh, the the effects in terms of sea level rise would be way more dramatic than, uh, than anything that might be happening in the Arctic Circle. Yes, so um, if you think about the ice sheets and the ice shelves around Antarctica, there's definite signs that they're accelerating and melting, um, particularly around the West Antarctic. Um, the amount of sea level rise that might be attributed to Antarctica eventually could be up to 80 metres. That's over a very long period, but it's got a, or a large amount of the fresh water um, ice that we have on the planet is in Antarctica. And we do have to be very concerned about that. I do have a, um, a picture that I'd like to share with you, which is the uh, temperature patterns from the uh, CMIP-6 models. So these are the models that will be used for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's next assessment. And those um, diagrams show uh, the temperature change simulated by models over the historical period, which matches very well with observations. Uh, they also show uh, different uh, scenarios based on uh, shared socioeconomic pathways and those can vary from our temperatures increasing by an extra one degree to one and a half degrees all the way up to about six degrees by the mean um, for the mean and temperatures in those higher um, scenarios where we're emitting more um, greenhouse gases for longer would be disastrous for Antarctica. We've also got to remember that um, so far, the Montreal Protocol has been very positive in terms of reducing the amount of ozone depleting substances in the atmosphere, but we could face a perfect storm where the, um, the ozone hole has been acting as a break. Uh, greenhouse gases have been acting as the accelerator for changing climate. And if we take our foot off the brake by the ozone hole recovering and uh, continue to keep our foot on the accelerator by um, continuing to emit greenhouse gases, we could have very, very significant um, warming over the Antarctic continent, which would 
mean severe um, losses in terms of um, ice. It would also mean significant problems associated with the, uh, the ecosystems over Antarctica. So for instance, uh, some research from colleagues at University of Canterbury has shown that if we um, keep to the Paris Agreement, then it's likely that some fragile ecosystems will uh, be able to survive. But if we don't, then we are potentially looking at extinctions of cer certain ecosystems. So for instance, um, emperor penguins, 83% of that population might have been destroyed by 2100 if we don't keep to the Paris Agreement. The, um, yeah, the, the, the scenarios all sound uh, um, deeply, deeply worrying, but, but some people might say, well, look, you know, there's hardly anybody down on uh, um, Antarctica. There's um, just a few of you scientists and, and uh, a depleting number of penguins. Um, that's sad, um, but, uh, you know, maybe it's not tragic for, for the globe as a whole. Um, but uh, um, I think the, the impacts go even beyond um, uh, Antarctica itself. Isn't that correct? Yes. No. Um, so Antarctica is effectively um, the radiator of the, the heat engine of the planet. So it's the place that acts as the cooling um, system for the, the planet. Um, and we're seeing that as well as um, we're seeing change already, Antarctica and the surrounding Southern Ocean have really important impacts in terms of holding back change already. So for instance, something like 73% of the ocean heat uptake that's taking that extra heat in the atmosphere into the ocean occurs south of 30 degrees south. So the Southern Ocean is absolutely vital in ocean heat uptake for the planet. We are also seeing that something like 43% of anthropogenic carbon dioxide that gets taken up by the oceans is associated with the Southern Ocean again. So the Southern Ocean and Antarctica are already regulating the, the worst impacts of climate change. And therefore they're really vital components for us to understand. They have their aerial coverage compared to how big an impact they have is very small. So they're very important regions to examine. No, thanks. That's, yeah, it's really important to know. So just as the Amazon is the lungs of the world, um, I guess this is the, uh, the, the temperature controlling mechanism. Um, and yes. uh, we, know, we know we're putting it hugely under strain. Um, look, do we have time, do you think? Um, and uh, um, the ability to, to stop this worst case scenario from unfolding? Yes, no, there's definitely positives. And we can see multiple positives in multiple respects. So the different shared socioeconomic pathways, they are all achievable still. And we, we're still making decisions as a, as a planet on those. And, and uh, some of those shared socioeconomic pathways allow us to keep temperatures well below those dangerous levels of above two degrees C. So we definitely can do that. And as well as there being positives in terms of the environment and climate, there are also positives in terms of um, being a better world. So the average gross domestic product of the world does better in those low um, scenarios than the rest of the world. Uh, there's more equity in the world with those social uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. So there's more equity around the world in terms of making sure that everybody's got wealth. Um, so yeah, no, that there are possibilities and um, yes, there are, we can do things yeah. still. Excellent. And, um, and there'll be uh, um, more of those um, uh, potentially endangered emperor penguins left, which is uh, um, a hugely important thing, the, the uh, uh, impacts on biodiversity. Um, uh, have have already been, you know, um, so scary. Uh, having watched uh, David Attenborough's uh, A Life on the Planet um, just uh, um, the other week, and and seeing how much biodiversity has disappeared in in his admittedly very long life. Um, 
I wondered if you might share with us um, just a, a little bit some of the uh, the, the, the types of um, climate and environmentally uh, related research uh, that uh, um, is being done in the Antarctic at the moment and, and what that's revealed so far. Right. So I, I guess that um, there's a significant amount of work um, internationally and within New Zealand on uh, looking at the Antarctic and Southern Ocean and how they are important. Um, some of the latest climate models from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is CMIP6 program um, are showing that the sensitivity of the climate system to carbon dioxide is higher than it would have been, uh, than it has been in previous um, systems. That's, uh, or in, in previous model simulations. And that's um, problematic because it means that we, we might be facing an even worse case scenario than we were six or seven years ago. Uh, but one of the things that we found is that um, clouds over the Southern Ocean are really, really important regulator of the, the climate system overall. So uh, there's been many multinational efforts, particularly led by the American and the Australian programs, as well as work from New Zealand um, under the Deep South National Science Challenge um, to work on understanding why cloud feedbacks aren't um, a, a, a cause of change such that um, the Southern Ocean clouds are potentially meaning that we're more sensitive to climate change. And it's largely associated with the fact that the, uh, the unique environment that we are in the Antarctic where, and the Southern Ocean, where effectively we, in the Northern Hemisphere, we, we don't have a pristine environment, that, so there's more pol pollution, which produces aerosols and black carbon. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, we have a pristine environment and any changes that we make have a very big in impact on those things. We're all, we've also seen that Antarctica, the ice core records that we've identified have allowed us to identify that the changes we're seeing and the rate of changes we're seeing in terms of temperatures are larger than we've seen for hundreds of thousands of years. And that's really critical to say, we've seen these, we're doing something very fast to our system. We've never done this kind of experiment before. We've never, a civilization has never gone through this before. It's really quite scary. Yeah. Um, it is, and, and the evidence uh, um, is uh, increasingly uh, incontrovertible. Um, I understand one of the things you're working on at the moment is, is looking at uh, whether microplastics have managed to find their way um, into that pristine environment in, uh, in the Deep South. Um, uh, I know that uh, plastic use has gone through the roof um, in various ways this year um, as, as part of our essential coping mechanisms for, for dealing with the pandemic. Um, but uh, it's another uh, hugely worrying development. Um, can, you, uh, can you reassure us that, uh, that there is still a pristine environment down where you are? Unfortunately, I'm not sure I can say that. So last year, uh, my colleague, Dr. Laura Revel, um, asked us to uh, collect some, micro, some snow samples to, to, to examine whether snow, uh, microplastics were in them. She, her and her Sandra Alves found microplastics in every snow sample that we found. We are double checking those measurements this year. So to say that we have a pristine environment is, is not necessarily true, unfortunately. Um, that's uh, that's deeply worrying, uh, and um, uh, I, I know that uh, in New Zealand, just uh, yesterday or the day before, there was uh, um, the government declared um, a climate uh, emergency. Um, I think, uh, to me, I see uh, you know the uh, the tide is turning a little bit. The uh, the impetus is really growing to to take serious action um, on issues like climate change and plastic pollution. Um, but uh, we've got a, um, a big uphill battle and a long way, way to go. Um, and now we're talking in the context of a fintech festival. 
neither you nor I um, probably know anything um, about fintech other than uh, perhaps as we use our credit cards from time to time. Um, but uh, why should a group of fintech specialists care um, about uh, the work you are doing um, and what you are finding out? Um, and, and how is what you're seeing going to be relevant to the world of uh, international finance? Okay, so I'll talk about finance. Um, so, so for instance, um, we're already being able to attribute um, large costs towards climate change. So, for instance, between 2007 and 2017, extreme precipitation events, so flooding events mostly in, in New Zealand, cost New Zealand about $365 million dollars. Of that, about a third of that could be directly attributed to uh, human-induced climate change. So in terms of adaptation, there are significant costs associated with adapting to a world where we've emitted more greenhouse gases. There, on the positive side, there are also significant opportunities in technology and developing those technologies and those new build, those new and businesses coming out of those technologies that could significantly enhance the world's economy and also distribute wealth across uh, nations more evenly. So mitigation is a good thing from an economic viewpoint, as well as um, meaning that we don't have to pay those costs associated with climate change adaptation. So that there's positives in, in both sides. Um, to um, do something positive about greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's really important to to focus on that that positive message. And and uh, I think um, we're seeing governments around the world recognizing that digital technology um, is a huge enabler and and a hugely important part of the economic recovery post pandemic. Uh, so uh, I think that's one of the areas of, of innovation um, that can help us uh, as we collectively uh, take on the, the climate change uh, challenge. Look, my last question for you, Adrian, is a personal one, a more personal one, and that is um, what drew you to this work and what does it mean to you personally? Um, so this was the question that you, you gave me this question a little while ago, and, and I thought about hardest. And so when I was at school, I really enjoyed physics and uh, science, um, motivated by a teacher. And uh, she was a, a great teacher. She could see that I had a spark about science and I, I did science. I went to university and decided I was always going to be an academic, um, which was kind of surprising. Not many people when they're 15 or 16 decide I'm going to be a professor at some point in the future, but that's what I want, always wanted to be. And uh, when I was choosing uh, my further study, it was obvious that climate change was uh, a really important issue even then. And I can remember volunteering in an Oxfam shop, so a charity shop, um, and there were lots and lots of issues associated with droughts in Africa at the time. And I think that that was a big motivating factor for my reasoning for uh, taking up climate science. Um, how I got into Antarctic science? Well, I think it was partly being really, really lucky. But I can understand the really important consequences of Antarctic's climate for the rest of the planet. Um, and yeah, I wanted to do my little bit for the world, basically. Thank, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, we can see, um, but not really, uh, that you're in a, um, a very, very different world down there. We've got a tiny glimpse through uh, the, the windows of, of the room you're sitting in. Um, and yep. uh, um, it's, uh, it must be such an incredible privilege um, and, uh, uh, an ad adventure, a real adventure to um, be able to go to the ice and, and not just do it once, but to, to do it many times. I'm sure that that thrill, that um, excitement at seeing that pristine world, at seeing the biodiversity down there that is still flourishing 
um, is uh, uh, a hugely uh, and richly rewarding thing for you. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, I, I found that really illuminating um, and it is uh, just uh, fantastic that we have the technology that enables us um, to speak uh, across many thousands of miles and it's probably not that long ago since uh, the only way we could do it was through a satellite phone. Yeah, no, thank you very much for talking to me, Joe. It was a privilege. And um, yeah, it, as I say, it was um, very positive. And yeah, it, it's great to be able to talk to you from Scott based. Um, and uh, hopefully the people at FinTech see this as being a useful discussion to have. And it starts some interesting conversations. I'm sure they will. And keep up the great work. Okay, thank you.